Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. The Bell Jar. By Sylvia Plath. American poet Sylvia Plath's novel The Bell Jar was published in 1963 and is considered one of her best works. Plath wrote the story under the pseudonym Victoria Lucas and published it first. The novel was released under her real name when she died a month after it was published, though. As Plath's sole work of fiction, The Bell Jar is widely seen as semi autobiographical and a reflection of the poet's own experiences. In accordance with her desires, the book was not released in the United States until 1971. As a result, it has been translated into more than a dozen languages around the world. Esther Greenwood, a young lady working as a guest magazine editor in New York City in the 1950s, is the focus of the novel. As the story progresses, it becomes clear that Esther suffers from depression and that, when her internship has ended and she has no idea what to do with the rest of her life, she begins to take her own life. An overdose of sleeping medications results in Esther being hospitalized. In a kind doctor's care, she progressively recovers and regains her positive attitude on life. Esther plans to return to college at the end of the story, but she is aware that her mental illness may resurface at any time. In the summer of 1953, Esther Greenwood, a young woman from New York City, works as a guest editor for a fashion magazine for a few weeks. Several young women who work as guest editors dwell in an apartment complex called the Amazon. Esther is able to attend college because to a scholarship provided by Philomena Guinea, a well-to-do businesswoman. Doreen, a snarky southern girl, is Esther's best friend. Throughout the first chapter, Esther tries to come to terms with the truth that she's bored and restless. It's not clear to her why she doesn't love her life despite the fact that she has a great career, nice clothes, and invitations to expensive parties. Esther believes that most girls would enviously covet her life, but she isn't content with it. A kind Midwestern girl named Betsy is constantly making an effort to befriend Esther despite the fact that it makes Betsy very unhappy. Esther and Betsy share a cab one day as they make their way to a party hosted by Esther's magazine. Esther refuses to go with her and instead takes a cab with Doreen. During their cab ride, a man approaches and persuades the girls to join him and his pals to a pub, which they accept. The man introduces himself as Lenny Shepard when they speak with him. He flirts with Doreen and convinces his friend Frankie to keep Esther company while he woos Doreen. Esther, who is much taller than Frankie, dislikes Frankie because of his height. She begins to imbibe and introduces herself to the patrons of the pub as Ellie Higginbottom to their amusement. Esther and Doreen leave with Lenny, and Frankie goes it alone later in the night. With Lenny's permission, Esther and Doreen return to his apartment with him. The interior of the residence is designed to resemble a western-themed ranch. Lenny plays a cassette of his radio show while he's there, adding that he enjoys listening to himself talk. Lenny gets up and dances with Doreen and Esther falls asleep in a chair while the three continue drinking to their heart's content. As time goes on, Esther chooses to leave the party, and manages to walk 48 blocks home alone despite being intoxicated. Sober and swollen from the walk, she gets into the house. While she gazes out her window, she reflects on how lonely she feels and the sense of isolation she feels from the rest of those who are out and about in the city. After a relaxing bath and a good night's sleep, she is rudely awoken by a bellowing Doreen at her door. Doreen is babbling incoherently as Esther opens the door. She places her on the floor and walks out of the room. Doreen throws up, and Esther makes the decision that she will no longer be friends with Doreen, despite her plans to continue spending time with her in the future. Doreen is nowhere to be found when she opens her door the next morning. We see each other for the first time, Doreen and Lenny. Esther attends a Ladies' Day magazine lunch in the following day. Since Esther had never eaten in a genuine restaurant before arriving in New York, she is amazed at how much she appreciates the food at these banquets. The caviar her grandfather gave her as a gift at a country club soon became her favorite treat. Esther enjoys two plates of caviar and other goodies at this luncheon. In response to Betty's inquiry as to why she was absent from a fur display that morning, Esther breaks down in tears and explains that her boss, J.C., had summoned her to his office. Esther informs J.C. that she enjoys her career when he inquires about it. After the job is done, Esther's supervisor asks her what she plans to do next, and she admits that she doesn't know the answer. Hesitantly, however, she admits that she wants to try her hand at writing. However, Esther believes she does not have the time for a language course in her final year plan because she is already working full-time in the publishing industry. She recalls a bluff she pulled on a professor once in order to evade a chemical assignment. 
Because she needed to free up time in her schedule for a Shakespeare class, she begged the dean to allow her to take chemistry without being graded. However, in actuality, she was just interested in getting out of the chemistry class and not taking the Shakespeare lesson. Esther's dean and chemistry teacher, Mr. Monsey, accepted it because they thought her desire to attend the class only for the sake of studying demonstrated maturity. Esther was a brilliant student. While Esther was in class, she pretended to take notes on the material but was really simply creating poetry. She now feels remorseful for lying to her teacher. Before sending her out to the banquet, JC gives Esther a few more edits and speaks to her with tenderness. It's hard for Esther not to compare her mother to JC when she thinks of her own mother. It is Esther's mother's opinion that Esther should not work for a magazine since she knows how difficult it is for a woman to make a living on her own. When Esther was nine years old, her father passed away, leaving her with nothing. The girls all go to the movies after the feast, but Esther gets sick halfway through and has to leave. On their trip back to her flat, Betty and Esther are interrupted by Esther's vomiting till she passes out on the bathroom floor. She's been diagnosed with food poisoning by a nurse. Doreen tries to feed Esther soup when she wakes up later. The next day, Esther is awakened by a phone call from Constantine, a UN translator. On the other hand, Esther believes he invited her to the UN as a favor for Mrs. Willard, and so she agrees without hesitation. Buddy Willard, the son of Mrs. Willard, is currently being treated for tuberculosis in a sanitarium. Until they started dating, Esther was head over heels in love with Buddy. He recently asked her to marry him, but she has yet to respond. In her hometown, Buddy is a student pursuing a doctorate in medicine and continues to write to her. Esther has second thoughts about marrying him because he isn't sure if he wants a poet or a writer for a wife. Esther distinctly recalls a visit she paid to Buddy while she was a student at Yale. His medical classes were filled with fascinating sights, including a class where a woman was giving birth. The birth of the baby shocked Esther, even if she didn't say anything about it. Esther thought it sounded like a medicine manufactured by a male when Buddy informed her that the woman had been given a drug to make her forget the pain. Esther and Buddy return to Buddy's room after the childbirth class. Esther says she has never seen a man naked before when Buddy inquires. Then he removes his clothing and asks her if she wants to see him naked. Depressing images of male genitalia bring to mind a turkey neck and gizzards for her. Esther asks him whether he has ever had sex with anyone and refuses to let him see her naked. He claims that he had sex with a woman named Gladys while working on Cape Cod over the summer. Not because Buddy had an affair, but because he lied about it for so long, this news has upset Hester. Inquiring about their thoughts on this confession, Esther's female friends respond by telling her that until she is pinned or engaged, a woman has no right to be offended. As soon as she decided to break up with Buddy, he phoned her long distance to tell her that he had tuberculosis. Because she was relieved, the other residents of the building stopped bothering her about going out on Saturday nights. Esther is picked up by Constantine and driven to the UN. They discuss about Mrs. Willard during the drive and both admit that they dislike her. Since her father's death, Esther hasn't felt this good about anything. Although she admires Constantine and regards him as lovely, she is concerned about his height. Once again, Esther is blown away by Constantine's abilities as an interpreter while they are both at the UN. While the fig leaves represent all of the numerous roles she may play in her life, she is unable to choose any of them and so the tree's figs all decay and fall to the ground. Esther begins to feel better when Constantine takes her out to dinner. She makes the decision to sleep with him in order to exact revenge on Buddy. Her virginity is unrealistic because even Buddy, a man she considers to be wholesome, isn't. Even though they slept in the same bed that night, Constantine only wanted to talk to Esther, which disappointed her. In the wee hours of the morning, she rouses herself and gazes at Constantine as he sleeps. In Esther's mind, marriage would jeopardize her career goals. Since they've had a baby, Buddy has told her that she won't want to write poems. Buddy's father drove Esther to the sanatorium to see him, and she still remembers it. She broke down in tears as Mr. Willard told her he wanted to adopt her as his daughter. They appeared to him to be tears of happiness. Buddy asked Esther how she would like to be Mrs. Buddy Willard when she visited him. Buddy chuckled when Esther claimed she would never get married. Esther appears in a magazine picture session a few days later, carrying a paper rose as a symbol of the inspiration for her writings. When she is told to smile, she bursts into tears and screams. After a brief respite, JC returns with some stories for her to read and comment on. Are there any chances that JC would accept Esther's submission? Doreen invites Esther to a dance with her, Lenny, and a friend of Lenny's on her last night in the city. 
The first thing Esther does when she gets to the dance is presume that her date, Marco, is a man who hates women. When they first meet, he presents her with a diamond pin and promises to do something special for her. Bruises appear on her arm as a result of his strangulation. Marco makes Esther dance even if she doesn't want to. When she's through with him, he takes her outside by herself. When Esther asks if he has a crush on anyone, he replies that he has a crush on his cousin, but he can't have her because she is going to be a nun. Esther's dress is ripped by Marco as he gets upset and pushes her into the mud. If she does nothing but lie there, she convinces herself, it will happen. Esther fights Marco after he calls her a slut and punches him in the nose. Marco backs down after hearing this. However, before he departs, he informs Esther that he need the diamond to be returned. Unless she gives it to him, he'll shatter her neck. Leave him in the mud searching for her pocketbook and diamonds, Esther. Doreen was nowhere to be seen, so Esther got a cab back to Manhattan and climbed the roof of her building in search of her. There, she unloads her pricey clothing, one item at a time, over the railing and into the river below. Esther heads back to Boston the following day. Rejected, her mother reveals the bad news at the railway station when she greets her daughter. Because she has no plans for the summer, Esther is displeased. This letter from Buddy tells her that he is infatuated with the nurse, but that she may win him back if she visits him in the hospital. On the reverse side, Esther writes that she is engaged to a UN interpreter and does not want to see Buddy ever again. She then returns Buddy's letter by regular mail. As soon as Esther makes the decision to begin writing a novel, she swiftly becomes discouraged by her lack of prior writing experience. Her short-term and long-term plans are uncertain, so Esther floats around for a while. Intense frustration and depression set in for her. A visit to the doctor for sleep aids does occur, but the doctor instead recommends that she consult a psychiatrist. Dr. Gordon, a psychiatrist, sees Esther. With no energy and no sleep for a week, she hasn't showered or changed her clothes for weeks. Dr. Gordon's good looks and air of self-importance make Esther suspicious right away. At first Esther thinks that Dr. Gordon places a picture of himself and his family on his desk to deter female patients from making attempts. Despite her mother's reluctance to pony up the $25 per hour that Dr. Gordon charges, Esther makes it a point to see him on a weekly basis. At some point during their consultation, Dr. Gordon reveals to Esther's mother that she would require shock treatments in order to address her despair and suicidal ideas. Esther suffers from an inability to read and write legibly. Esther is apprehensive about the shock therapy, but she knows she has no choice. She begins to question what she did to deserve this treatment as soon as she begins receiving it. It makes her remember the time she shocked herself with her dad's lamp. Afterward, Esther informs her mother she no longer wants to see Dr. Gordon and her mother is relieved, saying her she was sure that she would choose to get better. After reading about the death of a young actress who was in a coma, Esther decides to look up the actress's picture in the newspaper. If the woman's eyes were open in the picture, she believes they would have the same dead, black and blank appearance as her own. She makes the decision to kill herself after five minutes of sitting on a park bench. She often hears a small chorus of voices repeating critical things that people in her life have said to her throughout the years in her mind. Instead of cutting her wrist, she tries to slit her calf, but she fails. In order to stop bleeding, she would have needed a warm bath after she sliced her wrist, so she heads to the beach. She contemplates jumping into the ocean to drown, but the heat is too much for her, so she returns home. A few days later, Esther and Jody, together with Jody's boyfriend Mark and an older man named Cal, visit the beach. The subject of Cal's suicide comes up as they discuss a local performance. Esther and he are both disappointed when he informs her he would shoot her. She believes that self-inflicted gunshot wounds are a more masculine method of suicide. If she were to get her hands on a pistol, she knows she wouldn't know exactly where to aim it at. She decides to commit suicide once more by jumping into the ocean. She joins Cal in the water and, although he tells her he's weary, she continues swimming alone in the middle of the ocean. She plans to keep going until she exhausts herself, at which point she will give up and drown. While swimming, she repeats the mantra I am, I am, I am. Esther reflects on the morning that she attempted to hang herself but was unable to accomplish the task. Instead of taking her own life, she pondered going back to the doctor, but she didn't want to bury her family in medical debts. Esther's body bobs back to the surface whenever she tries to sink below the surface of the water. Volunteering at the local hospital and even thinking about becoming a nun are some of Esther's methods for overcoming her depressive state. For the first time, she visits her father's grave and begins to mourn. 
Esther decides to take a sleeping pill overdose and heads home to write her mother a goodbye letter. Afterwards, she retreats to a crawl space, swallows about 50 tablets, and falls asleep. It's a hospital bed with bandages on her head instead of death that Esther wakes up in. A mirror shows her damaged face and shaved head, so she goes to get one. Esther drops the mirror, causing it to shatter. Mrs. Tomaliolo, a patient in the new hospital, shares a room with her. In response to her telling Mrs. Tomaliolo that she attempted suicide, the woman requests that the doctors close off the area between them. When Esther's mother shows up to visit, she chastises her for not paying attention to what the physicians had to say. Her mother promises Esther that she would make every effort to get her out of the hospital. The nurses and their trays are kicked to the ground by Esther as she rages at them. She manages to take a sphere of mercury after breaking a thermometer. As a result of Philomena Guinea's generous donation, Esther is now receiving treatment at a prestigious private mental health facility at no cost to her. A letter from Guinea reveals that she was a patient in an asylum and asks Esther to write back. Although Esther is aware of the woman's help, she is unable to feel any gratitude. She feels like she's in a jar of sorrow that she can't get out of. As they drive to the new hospital, Esther contemplates jumping out of their car onto the Charles Bridge and leaping into the river below, but she is restrained by her mother and brother. A female psychiatrist, Dr. Nolan, has been hired as Esther's new psychiatrist, which pleases her. She complains to Dr. Nolan about her electroshock treatments, and he informs her that they were done wrongly and that the next time she has them, it will be a completely different experience. Esther is prescribed insulin shots three times a day by Dr. Nolan. As another patient called Valerie explains to Esther, she used to be furious all the time, but now she feels cheerful because of her lobotomy scars. Joan Gilling, an old college classmate who now lives in the ward, surprises Esther one day. Esther asks Joan what she means when she says she came to the asylum after reading about Esther. Diagnosed with depression recently and referred to a psychiatrist, where she was forced to recount in front of nine student doctors her symptoms. Joan walked away from the doctor's office in disgust after he informed her that she needed group therapy. Esther's disappearance came up in the news that day. Her newspaper clippings are on display for all to see. Esther was initially reported missing by the newspaper, but it later stated that a search party had been hunting for the missing girl. When Esther's mother heard moaning as she was doing laundry, she discovered her daughter in the crawl area. Joan committed suicide as a result of being motivated by these newspaper clippings. In addition to this, Esther is visited by former classmates and instructors, but she despises each and every one of them since they lack the appropriate words to say to her. Esther despises going to visit her mother, who blames Esther for her illness. A new ward is set aside for the ladies who will be released soon, and Esther is transferred there. In the meanwhile, she is glad that the shock treatments are no longer on the table. In her fashion magazine, Joan discovers a picture of Esther. However, Esther tells her that it is actually someone else. Upon learning that she will be receiving another shock treatment, Esther is afraid and enraged with Dr. Nolan for failing to inform her, and the two have a falling out. It was Dr. Nolan's wish for Esther's peace of mind to conceal the knowledge from her. There, she explains to Esther that the treatment will be done by herself, and the nurse who is helping is very kind to the girl. While Esther is undergoing the treatment, she falls asleep at the first opportunity. When Dr. Nolan brings Esther outside after her treatment, she feels as if her bell jar has been removed and she can finally breathe freely once again. Shock treatments will be administered three times a week, according to Dr. Nolan. Esther firmly rejects Joan's confessions that she is drawn to her and that she is a lesbian. That fear of pregnancy and desire for the kind of independence that men enjoy are expressed later by Esther to Dr. Nolan. As a result of Dr. Nolan's referral, Esther has a diaphragm fitted and is relieved that she no longer has to worry about becoming pregnant and being compelled to marry the father. Esther decides that she wants to find the right man to have sex with. Within a short time, Joan has left the hospital and informed Esther that she plans to pursue a career in mental health care. Esther feels envious of Joan's goals and her impending departure, despite the fact that she will be going shortly as well. Esther is given permission by the hospital to visit the city, where she meets Irwin, a math professor. After a cup of coffee, Esther follows him back to his place. Dr. Nolan grants her permission to stay the night by convincing her that she is staying at Joan's apartment. A stinging discomfort is all that Esther feels after having sex with Erwin the night before. She panics when she realizes she is bleeding, but Erwin calms her down by telling her that there is nothing to be concerned about. Esther bandages herself with a paper towel and asks Erwin to drive her to Joan's place, 
but the bleeding continues. When Joan brings Esther to the hospital, a doctor tells her that this level of blood loss is unusual for a first sexual experience. He halts the flow of blood. Esther learns of Joan's disappearance a few nights later and learns the following morning on the news that Joan committed suicide by hanging herself in the woods. With her graduation fast approaching, Esther wonders how she will adjust to college life now that she has experienced so much. Everybody will pretend as if her episode of madness was just a bad dream, according to her mother. Buddy's sickness has made him more withdrawn and unsure of himself, so he visits her less frequently. As she has spent time in an institution, he wonders who will marry her now that she is free. In a phone call, Esther asks Irwin to pay her doctor's bill from the night of their sex. His curiosity is piqued when she informs him they won't be seeing each other again and hangs up on him, relieved that he can't find her. After saying her final goodbyes to Valerie, she exudes a sense of liberation. I am, I am, I am, Esther repeats to herself as she attends Joan's funeral. In the final chapters of the novel, Esther is getting ready for her hospital exit interview and is tensely anticipating its start. She's ready to depart, but she's also aware that her disease could strike again at any time. Esther Greenwood, the protagonist and main narrator of the novel. As a guest editor for a fashion magazine, Esther works as a young woman in New York City. Many of the things that most females seek, including nice clothing, a great job, and regular parties to attend, do not make Esther happy, and she is unable to figure out why. Esther is unable to connect with anyone or anything in her world, and she has a peculiar sense of alienation from it. There are times when she does things that she doesn't realize are hurting other people's feelings. When Esther is rejected from the writing course she had applied for and discovers that she has no alternative plans for the future, her melancholy and suicidal impulses quickly escalate. She also battles with her sexual identity and finds that she prefers to lose her virginity to a stranger, in direct contrast to society's values at the time. However, she has a fear of getting pregnant and will only engage in sexual activity with a man if she is certain that she will not become pregnant as a result of the encounter. Having been fitted with a diaphragm, Esther feels safe enough in Boston to have sex with the man she meets there. Esther has made some progress in her recovery from her mental illness by the end of the story, and she believes she is ready to return to school. Nevertheless, she is aware that the depression may return at any time. Esther's fate is left to the reader's discretion at the end of the story. Buddy Willard, Esther's one-time boyfriend. Buddy is a medical student who embodies the ideal 1950s male cultural ideal. He is attractive, intelligent, a good student, a member of the church, and so on. Before they start dating, Esther admires Buddy from afar, but as they get to know each other, she begins to discover his flaws and grow dissatisfied. Esther believes Buddy to be a virgin, so when he confesses to sleeping with a waitress while he was on Cape Cod in the summer, she is horrified. It upsets Esther more than Buddy's admission that he was not a virgin because he didn't tell her. Esther is also displeased with Buddy's apparent attempt to shape her into the ideal wife without taking her wants into account. Because he doesn't see the point, Buddy doesn't want her to keep composing poems. He predicts that once she has children, she will no longer desire to write. As if that wasn't bad enough, Buddy has a tendency to be harsh at times. It is revealed to Esther in the book that he had sex with the waitress because he was attracted to her since she was free, white, and 21. In the end, though, Buddy has transformed and become more worldly after having been through a long illness and therapy. Mrs. Greenwood, Esther's mother. For the most part, the story of Mrs. Greenwood takes place in the shadows, but she is an important character nonetheless. Esther's psyche is permeated with her mother's beliefs about the perfect woman of the 1950s, which Mrs. Greenwood enthusiastically espouses. She often ponders whether or not her mother would approve of what she is doing at any particular time. She frequently reminds Esther that she hopes her writing won't interfere with her duty as a future mother and wife and pushes her to find a more practical career than writing. Esther's mother, Mrs. Greenwood, appears to care for her, but she is clueless about her daughter's mental health. When Esther confesses to Dr. Nolan that she despises her mother, he acts as if this is a major development in Esther's rehabilitation. Sylvia Plath was born on the 27th of October, 1932, in Boston. While still a young child, Plath lost his father, an accomplished entomologist and professor of biology at Boston University. Plath began composing poetry in the same year and had her first piece published in the Boston Herald's children's section the following year. 
Plath published numerous additional poems in local publications and newspapers as a child and was the recipient of her first award from the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards when she was 17 years old. The year was 1950, and Plath had just graduated from high school when she was published for the first time in the Christian Science Monitor. After high school, she enrolled in Smith College, where she excelled academically during her first two years. During her third year of college, she worked as a guest editor at Mademoiselle magazine as well as editing the college newspaper, The Smith Review. Plath fell into a deep despair as a result of the experience not being what she had dreamed it would be. To treat her depression, Plath underwent electroconvulsive therapy after attempting suicide in 1953 by overdosing on sleeping pills. Plath returned to college in 1955 after spending six months in a psychiatric facility. Plath earned the Glassock Prize for her poetry to lovers and a beachcomber by the Real Sea shortly after graduation. After that, she was awarded a full scholarship to attend one of Cambridge University's women-only colleges. Plath continued to write and publish poems while attending Cambridge, where she met her future husband Ted Hughes, a well-known poet, in 1956. A mutual love of poetry, astrological studies, and the occult brought Plath and Hughes together. They got married in London in 1956 and migrated to the United States the following year. Plath first worked as a receptionist in the psychiatric ward of Massachusetts General Hospital before beginning her teaching career at Smith College. The poets Anne Sexton and George Starbuck, among others, became close friends with her during this time as she continued to write. At this time, Plath began undergoing treatment for depression for the second time. It was in 1959 that she and Hughes returned to England, settling at Three Cacket Square in London, where Plath commemorates their stay. Her first collection of poems, The Colossus, was published in 1960, the same year she gave birth to a daughter called Frida. When Plath became pregnant for the second time, she miscarried and gave birth to a stillborn child. It was in this year that Plath began writing The Bell Jar, her sole book, which is semi-autobiographical. A year after giving birth to a baby named Nicholas in 1962, her husband was discovered to have an affair with the woman who was renting their house by her husband that year. It was in July of that year that she and Hughes divorced. It was in October of that year that Plath began to write feverishly and pen most of the poems that she has become famous for. She and her children returned to London in December. Plath's depression reappeared during the winter, but she persevered in her work and finished the collection of poems that would be released after her death. Additionally, she finished and released her first novel, The Bell Jar, in the same year. During this time, Plath suffered from severe depression and made several attempts at suicide. He later confessed to authorities that she drove her automobile into a river in an attempt to kill herself in 1962. During a visit with a doctor in 1963, she revealed to him that she was unable to write because of her sadness. To help her, her doctor prescribed an antidepressant and began making regular house calls to see if she needed to be taken to the hospital. Plath had a live-in nurse put in place by him. Plath was found dead in her home on February 11, 1963, with her head in the oven, from carbon monoxide poisoning, by the nurse who had come to assist her in caring for her children. At the time, she was just 30. Hepkinstall Church in West Yorkshire, England, holds her ashes after a suicide investigation determined her death was self-inflicted. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Thank you.